On September 25, 1998, at 7.20 a.m., funeral director Darren Watts was starting his busy day when he received a call that would chill him to the bone. Mr. Watts owned the Watts Funeral Home at Lawrence Avenue East in Kingston Road in Toronto, Canada. The caller, 36-year-old Edward Dooley, nicknamed Tony, stated they needed the funeral home to come get his 7-year-old son, who was deceased in the home. He asked him if they had signed a death certificate, to which Edward informed him that he had not. Edward stated they did not want to call the police. That's a big red flag right there. Yeah, you got a little boy dead in the home. The father doesn't want to call the police. He just goes straight to the funeral home. That's a hundred red flags right in a row. Watts asked Edwards how his son had passed away. Edward stated his son had fell off the top bunk bed and had hit his head. Watts kept telling Edwards that the family must first call the police, who in turn would contact the coroner, and someone would sign the necessary death certificate to release the body. This is when Edward's wife, 32-year-old Marcia Dooley, took over the conversation and told Watts three times, you come get him. She told the same story that her seven-year-old stepson had died from after falling off the bunk bed. Watts stated he heard no signs of grief in Marcia's or Edward's voices, just a sense of urgency. After arguing with Watts for a bit and he refused to comply to their demands, the Dooleys called 911 36 minutes after the call to the funeral home. Watts, who had two little children, could not get the call off his mind. Hello, my name is Holly, and thank you for choosing to join me in the murder she shed for this rarely discussed true crime. I chose this true crime story of seven-year-old Randall Dooley because I believe his case deserved some coverage after noticing his little life seemed to be forgotten in the media. This boy was a handsome little fella, and I don't want his name to be forgotten. Okay, before we begin, just make sure you smash the subscribe button to hear all my rarely discussed true crime cases. Right here in the Murder She Shed, with me and Simon. Right there, that's Simon. Peeking over, he's a cutie. You'll enjoy him. He's a mess. In November of 1997, seven-year-old Randall Dooley and his brother Tigo flew from his aunt's home in Jamaica to live with his father, Edward Dooley, in Toronto, Canada. Their Aunt Beatrice lived in Spanish Town, Jamaica, and had been caring for the two brothers for about six years before her brother Edward arrived to pick them up and take Randall and Tigo back to Canada. Randall and Tigo's biomother, at age 16, gave birth to Randall on August 12, 1991, in a squat stone hovel in a ramshackle yard where gunmen ran about in the night. The bio mother, Raquel Berth, abandoned both of the boys when they were just toddlers. The boy's aunt rescued the brothers from a drug-filled ghetto and started them on a more promising life in a working-class community in Spanish Town. Aunt Beatrice had no choice to give them up when their father, Edwards, came a-calling in 1997 and finally wanted his boys back. Suddenly, he wanted them. He had left them and went to Toronto years ago, and they just had their aunt. The aunt actually wanted to adopt them, but she wasn't able to because he came and got the boys before she could finish the adoption process. When Randall was four, he liked to sing in the choir at the tiny tabernacle of the Apostle Church of Jamaica across the street from his aunt's home. They walked over there. They went to church all the time. Tigo and Randall were more than just brothers. They were best friends. Tigo was just one year older than his brother. Although Randall was an extrovert, he was a wonderful athlete and loved to play football. He was smart and quick to show a smile and give a big hug. At the airport, the boys kissed their mommy Beatrice goodbye. They called her mommy at this point. That's all they knew. And they promised to come back and see her the next summer. One of them would never see her again. Edward Dooley married his wife, Marcia, in 1992, and they tried unsuccessfully for five years to have their own child. By the time the brothers actually arrived in Toronto, Marcia was pregnant with their first child, finally. Marcia took a particular dislike to Randall, seeing his coolness to her as an affront and a defiance. She also did not like the fact he looked a lot like his bio mom. Edward made his living as a drug dealer. 
just a couple weeks later after Edward brought the boys to live in Canada. He left the boys with his pregnant wife, Marcia, abandoned them in order to fly back to Jamaica to sell drugs, and he didn't return for six months. After the boys started school in Toronto, Randall's first grade teacher noticed that Randall was panicked after losing one of his mittens. She told him not to worry, children lose mittens all the time, something normal. But Randall looked scared and he said he would get a licking from his stepmom for losing that mitten. The next day, Randall came to school with a bruise beside his little wife. The teacher asked him what had happened and he stated Marcia had hit him with her shoe for losing his mitten. His first grade teacher notified her principal who noted it and asked her to watch the boy carefully. In early February, Randall showed up with his left arm in a sling. And when the teacher asked Marcia about it, Marcia said he had fallen on the ice. Really, Randall had broke his arm while Marcia had forcefully put a jacket on Randall, twisting his little arm behind his back and then jerking his arm up, tearing his jacket in the process. Marcia did take Randall to the hospital for cast, but she gave the hospital a fake last name for both of them. Then came the day that his teacher, Miss Robinson, made her grim discovery. Randall had been absent that morning and arrived late after lunch. The youngsters were already buzzing with excitement for reading Buddy Time. It's when the sixth graders come and read with the little ones. They were so excited every time. And Randall loved to read. But that day he came in without his usual hug for his teacher and just sat at his desk with his head in his arms. Miss Robinson asked Randall what was wrong. Each time Miss Robinson asked Randall replied, Nothing, Miss Robinson. But she persisted and eventually he allowed her to roll up his sleeves and she gasped when she saw his arms were covered in whip marks. Just all over his little arms, just crisscross marks. He was just so scratched up and bruised up. Miss Robinson promptly took Randall by the hand to the principal's office, Mr. Davidge. There he looked at the marks on Randall's arms. He immediately called Marcia, who told him the bruises came while Randall was playing with some cousins. She said the cousins were playing a game called lick a -lick. Never heard of it. Purportedly, a tag-like game where children hit each other with belts. What kind of game is that? I don't know. Have you guys heard of lick a -lick? I would have died if my cousins hit me with the belt. I mean, we played a lot of weird games, but that one was not included. After getting off the phone with Marcia, the principal called the authorities. The officer made note of reported crisscross welts going from Randall's forearms up over the shoulder and even on his back and decided he was dealing with a very, very serious incident. The officer made a visit to Marcia's apartment. He banged fiercely on the door, but though he could hear a television set blaring inside, no one answered. Back at the station, he spoke to his staff sergeant and asked her to assign some detectives as soon as she could. Two officers were assigned the next day. They talked to Marcia and were refused an opportunity to actually speak to Randall alone. Marcia said Randall was shy. So they spoke to Randall with Marcia right there. And Randall essentially just confirmed his stepmother's story. What did they think was going to happen when they spoke to him together at the same time? The child is scared, obviously, of this woman. He's not going to tell the truth. Sitting to Marcia's demand was probably the biggest single blunder in this so-called police investigation. In addition, it appears the officers made little effort to track down the mysterious cousin the stepmother was blaming for the injuries and for whom Marcia had no phone number, last name, or even address. The officers concluded they did not have grounds to lay a criminal charge. So everything was dropped. No more investigative work was done. Although the next day, one of the officers phoned the children aid services. In September, Edward returned from Jamaica and the family moved down the area with Randall and Tigo having changed schools. Though Randall, in fact, never made it to the new school. Before the move, Children's Aid Services never investigated any of those incidents at that last school. The day before Randall's first day of second grade at his new school, his dad Edward had beaten him so severely with a belt that they were scared to send him to school for fear that someone would notice the welts and alert child welfare authorities. 
She didn't want her new baby to be taken away. The belt had actually frayed from beating Randall so hard with it. So from that point until his death, little Randall was not allowed to go to school. Edward's father would only admit to the authorities that this was the only time he supposedly beat Randall. And he said most of the abuse was perpetrated by Marcia. Marcia would slap Randall, kick him, stomp on him, thrash him with a belt and a broom and a bungee cord. Marcia was known to stand on Randall's chest and jump up and down on this tiny little boy's chest. Marcia always locked Randall and Tigo into the room at night so they couldn't come out and eat all the food. Marcia told friends that Randall took a long time to eat meals and would often vomit several times a day. Randall was ordered by Marcia to eat his vomit. She claimed she didn't want the food being wasted. Randall's aunt in Jamaica told Edward to take Randall to a doctor. Edward said Marcia had taken him to the doctor and was told nothing was wrong. But later, there would be no evidence that she had ever taken Randall to the doctor. Marcia frightened him so much that he began peeing and soiling himself, which triggered her rage and violence, leading to more incontinence. Marcia told a friend she would do anything to find the money to send him back to Jamaica. But Edward was not agreeable to the idea because of fear that relatives were going to say he failed. I mean, it was better than you really, really failed and you have to go to prison for the rest of your life failed. It's better than that, wasn't it? Should have just claimed your failure right up front. In the month before Randall died, Marcia began beating him with a broomstick in her fist and she would knock him down with her elbow. The day before Randall died of a brain injury, he took almost four hours to eat his breakfast of cornflakes mixed with a hot dog. It just sounds like a really disgusting breakfast to begin with. But he ended up vomiting like five times. The evening before Randall died on September 25th, 1998, he urinated in his pants after dinner and she sent both boys upstairs. Marcia then had them come back down and drink some cod liver oil. When both boys had brushed their teeth and were in the room, Marcia came in and started beating Randall with slippers on his back and buttocks. She violently shook Randall, and when he attempted to climb onto the top bunk bed, he did fall and then hit his head. When Marcia realized Randall was now unconscious, she picked Randall up and took him to the bathtub, placing him inside with his pajamas still on and filling the tub with cold water, trying to wake him up. She sent Tigo downstairs to fetch ice and a spoon, then used the spoon to break up the ice and push it into Randall's mouth. When I say push it, I mean she pushed it violently into his mouth and knocked one of his teeth out. And the now semi-conscious boy ended up swallowing that tooth. Edward heard the commotion, came upstairs, and then took the spoon away from Marcia. Edward said, pay him no mind. Randall just wants attention, and he turned off the bathroom light and walked away, leaving both boys in the dark bathroom. That was the moment Edward turned out the light on his son's life. Randall's little brother, who was just a year older than him, Tico, then grabbed underneath his brother's armpits and lifted him out of the ice cold water. Randall, who only weighed 41 pounds at this point due to his malnutrition, was not hard to carry. Tigo was able to pick him up and carry him into their bedroom, where he put nice, clean, warm pajamas on Randall, and he wrapped him up in a blanket, and he put him in bed with him to try to warm him up, and they both fell asleep. Randall's rigid body was found in his brother's bunk bed the following morning by his father, more than 12 hours after suffering a fatal brain injury and a seizure. After first calling the funeral home, Edward then called emergency service and told them his son was dead because he had actually unalived himself. When emergency workers arrived at the house, Marcia and Edward were downstairs. No one was at the boy's side. Edward was on the phone and had to be told twice by a firefighter who was the first to arrive to hang up so they could get vital information from him. Edward appeared annoyed with the interruption, but he got off the phone, but then he immediately went to the fridge and took out two frozen hot dogs and placed them in the boiling water, because why not? Let's do lunch first. 
I mean, I just have a child that just died. Uh, but I just want some hot dogs. I'm really hungry right now. What the freak? It wasn't until he was bowling his hot dogs that Edward finally told the firefighter his son had fallen from the top of the bunk the night before. Marcia had shown the firefighters the way to the stairs, but she did not even come up with them. The emergency workers described her demeanor as very uncharacteristic. She was not excited and had not a single tear. After entering the bedroom where Randall laid on the bottom mattress of the bunk bed, it was immediately evident to the emergency workers that Randall's body was covered with injuries. Police seized a number of items from the house, including soiled clothes, a bungee cord that was found hanging from a planter in the family's living room. One of the seized belts, a 28-inch thin brown one, was found behind the toilet in the townhouse bathroom. Another belt was found in the master bedroom. It was 44 inches long and made almost entirely of metal. A series of imitation bullets riveted together with leatherette straps at the either end. After Edward was brought in for the police interview, he went back to saying his son had unalived himself. He couldn't make up which story he wanted to tell. He said Randall deliberately tried to suffocate himself by holding his head face down on the mattress. Have you ever heard of anybody doing that, unaliving yourself by suffocating yourself into the mattress? Never heard of that one. Speaking calmly and smiling or laughing frequently during a 107-minute videotaped interview. He said that his older son had told him Randall had talked about wanting to unalive himself. He described his dead son as having been clumsy, accident-prone, and resistant to Marcia's attempts to mother him. During Marcia's police interview, she said Randall would urinate in his pants, defecate in the bathtub, or make himself vomit to get into her head. She repeatedly denied ever hitting Randall and just kept saying, Speak to his father. Speak to his father. Over and over again during the interview. Randall had likely been dead for several hours by the time Edward placed the 911 call to report his son was not breathing and was stiff. The ME attributed Randall's death to a sustained and vigorous shaking, followed by a blunt blow to the right side of the head. The force caused a blood clot that in turn caused the right side of the brain to swell. Autopsy pictures show injuries in the shape of metal ends on Randall's body, thought to be from the metal ends of the bungee cord. Whippings in the last weeks of Randall's life left 70 to 80 marks on the child's back, buttocks, and the injuries would have made it extremely difficult for him to sit down. He only weighed 41 pounds at the time of his death. He also had fresh defensive injuries on his forearms, knuckles, and fingers, suggesting he tried to shield his head with his raised arms so he wouldn't get hit. Randall had swelling to the right side of the brain, a bruise on the scalp, a blood clot resembling black jelly that had started to seep out of its tiny confines on the right half of the brain, hemorrhaging in both optic nerves and retinas. Twelve fractured ribs were clearly visible from detailed x-rays taken during the autopsy. One of the x-rays revealed that missing tooth in Randall's stomach. Another x-ray showed a fracture of a bone in the lower spine. This injury had not had time to begin to heal. His elbow was fractured in several places. His brain had been damaged in four separate incidents, and his liver was lacerated. His lips and tongue were cut and bruised. The ME believed after the brain bleed and his brain began to swell, Randall had lived and suffered another 12 hours before dying. The only kindness he even received during that time was from his brother. The day after Randall Dooley's wrecked body was removed by the coroner, the boy's father and stepmother were too busy trying to see their other children even bother with funeral arrangements for little Randall. Edward and Marcia left it to Edward's cousin, Delora Martin, to make the calls about burying seven-year-old Randall. The Dooley spent the day speaking to the Children's Aid Society, which had apprehended Randall's eight-year-old brother, Tigo, and the five-month-old half-brother, as if they stood a chance to get them back after what they'd done. 
Donations from everywhere came in to help pay for Randall's funeral, and hundreds showed up to mourn for the little boy. Marcia received life with the possibility of pro in 18 years, and Edward received life with a possibility of pro in 13 years. In 2022, Marcia was granted day pro from police to reintegrate into society with the conditions placed on her offering some protection to the public. 2017, Edward Tony Dooley was granted day pro. So, I don't know much about Canada, but apparently life is not very long. Looks like they would have given them more years than what they got to me. Torturing and killing that little boy is just awful. Randall Dooley was buried in Pine Hill Cemetery in Ontario. The world may never notice if a snowdrop doesn't bloom, or even pause to wonder if the petals fall too soon. But every life that ever forms or ever comes to be touches the world in some small way for all eternity. Rest in peace, sweet Randall Dooley. I hope you're having fun in your little angel wings. This is a sad case. It's sad that children are treated like this. sad that these situations can't be stopped before they escalated. They had a time when they could stop it, what was happening to him. They seen it at the school. And yet, they didn't work fast enough to help this little boy out. He ended up losing his life. Can't even see your beautiful face, Bubba. Can't even see your beautiful face. Everybody wants to see your beautiful face. You have such a beautiful face. He's a beautiful boy. Say bye, we love you. Say bye, we love you, mini bee. Say bye, we love you, mini bee. My big tails today. Just in a pigtail mood, I guess. I don't know what's up with the pigtails. Guess I'm too old for pigtails. When you turn 50, I think that should be the cutoff age. But here I am wearing pigtails. Simon's leaving. I was gonna let him in, but he he wants by the four wheeler. I think I got the garage open, so he's laying in front of the four wheeler. That dog, all he thinks about is four wheelers. There can be a deer in the woods when we go through the woods. He don't even look at the deer. It's just all about four wheelers. He's a weird dog. Hey ho! People working on my house. He's got to be a little a-ho always. I'm hungry, Bubba. I know we should go eat some Cheetos and Dr. Pepper. Simon likes Cheetos too, it's not just me. If you watch my channel very much, you know I have this problem with Cheetos and Dr. Pepper. Like my two favorite things in the world, besides Simon, of course. <laughs> we both like Cheetos. He really likes Cheetos. I know you're not supposed to give dogs such things, but he only gets a few and he always begs me out of them. And there's something else weirdly strange. He likes Fig Newtons. Like, I hope it's not bad for dogs, but because he loves them. I don't even know if figs are bad for dogs, but I know he's like addicted to Fig Newtons. He will steal them out of my hand. I think he likes those more than Cheetos. Better go let Max outside. He was the one outside while ago, and I wouldn't let him. Reason I don't let Max in here because he will not be still. He's just like, I think he has... ADHD like me because he's constantly moving. He's like making all kinds of noise constantly. It says Simon, if he does lie, he actually lies. But Max has got to itch his butt or scratch his butt or do something all the time. Stomping your feet, oh, it's the beat of 